Project Controls uh, web forum called projectcontrolsonline.com. So we are taking this opportunity to um, introduce you guys with the concepts of planning and scheduling. This session is purely aimed with the fundamental aspects of planning and scheduling aimed purely towards the beginners and intermediate professionals. So tomorrow we have uh, all the advanced level topics which talks about the behavioral concepts and how the more earned schedules and how do you risk integrate with the schedules and try and look into more deeper aspects of project control. But this session is purely aimed at the individuals who have just entered into the project controls discipline, working into the planning, and just need to get some more idea about it, or who are working into the cost or say quantity serving and just want to understand what the planning functions are so that they can help uh, themselves in shaping their career path in planning and scheduling profession. So yeah, uh, without taking further time, we'll just proceed. Uh, the very first question which comes to anyone's mind is, what is planning and scheduling? Uh, there's a big debate uh, at the global level going on on this, and there is no consensus. And uh, that is why I cannot confidently tell you this is what it is. But we have made some attempt, and we have spoken to quite a few um, professionals in this industry and come to a conclusion uh, with, with certain definition that is what we're going to share with you here. So purely the planning is about the, um, it's aimed at actually objecting the influencing of the future. What, what you want to achieve, what basically you're going to, what, what tasks you're going to perform to achieve those objectives and how you're going to perform those tasks and who will perform those. So three questions we address is what, how and who. In the scheduling, we generally ask, uh, consider when and why. So, which goes into the more detailed level. So, you can see the, the planning and scheduling, they are allied sub-disciplines, you can call it. And it, there is a fine line which divides between these two and that basically goes to the timing. So, you build a plan and then you go to the schedule. So, in a way, you can say the schedule is a reflection of a plan. Sorry. So, yeah, that is what I just mentioned. Um, in, in, in the scheduling, we just determine the timings of the event and understand when these tasks are going to be performed and in what sequence they're going to be performed and they are actually the reflection of a plan. Um, in, a, in, a, in another concept, how we can distinguish planning and scheduling. Planning is more um, uh, your behavioral specific, it, it depends upon your interpersonal skills. It also uh, brings your uh, skills in negotiating, strategizing, vision, uh, and as well as questioning the basic objective of the project. Whereas the scheduling is more of the black and white, more of a calculation based thing. And that is why we sometimes say the planning is more of an art and scheduling is more of uh, a science actually. So we just try to show you the layout, how the plan moves to the schedule and give you a, a brief snapshot what happens and how plan moves to the schedule stage. So what happens um, when the project gets awarded, we have a kickoff meeting, we understand, okay, how are we gonna execute the plan? We create a project execution strategy, and then we identify uh, the steps going to be taken to meet those objectives. And that is where I think the planning process stops, and then you get into the scheduling, where you identify the detailed activities, you check it against the scope, and then you uh, <coughs> apply the duration based upon your experience, or based on your uh, previous projects, database, historicals. The logic and sequence, you do that uh, based on, again, um, the knowledge of the individual scheduler, and then build a schedule uh, based on these inputs, and then check it with the project criteria. It's very important, because sometimes project criteria varies from uh, stages to stages, and also from project to project. And then, of course, you resource loaded, you just see how my manpower histogram going to look like, how, many, how my equipment uh, profile is going to look like, am I going to meet, uh, am I going to get this much resources at this point of time? So you do all this uh, calculation thing, and then you adjust it, modify it, review it, and modify and issue it to the project team. So this is more of a calculation and more of the iterations part, what you do in the scheduling and in the, in the plan, as I said before, just more of you identify the objectives, how they're going to be met, and uh, what, what steps you need to take to those uh, meet those objectives. So we'll look about the uh, principles of planning. So how the plan should be. Um, as we said, it's a very high level document. It's, it's a very high level 
uh, concept we put in the uh, initial stage of the project, it, it should be sufficient enough to communicate the method of work education. For example, we're going to install, uh, okay, by the way, um, uh, all of my experience belongs to the EPC industry, so most of my ex uh, examples will be based around EPC sector. So, uh, if, if you need, uh, if you if you want to know more about the infrastructure projects or or IT projects, I can I can get you more information uh, of looking into it. So, the EPC projects, uh, for example, if you want to, you, you need to understand the project execution strategy. What you're going to do it? So you're going to subcontract it completely. You're going to self-perform it, and or whether you're going to mix it, whether it's going to be LSTK, whether it's going to be reimbursable. So, these key strategies you put in front of you and then put into the plan and that is what shows your work education strategy. Of course, in the plan you do not, you're not supposed to duplicate your, um, uh, the documents so, because it's a very high level document, you need to make sure it's a concise, it reflects what, how you're going to meet the objectives of the project and that is why you, uh, the, we, we, recover, we, recover, sorry, we recommend there should not be any duplication. Again, it's very critical. You need to identify the uh, potential problem areas. There could be a stages that you cannot meet the project objectives with, uh, in, in the normal standard uh, project life cycle. For example, you are starting into the construction, you are, you, you are awarding the procurement equipments, but then with those standard EPC cycle, you may not be able to achieve your um, objectives and then you may have to actually award something in advance. So these kind of problems, they need to be highlighted into the planning stage at the beginning of the uh, plan. Okay, this is the big thing. There are two approaches which way you do the top, uh, do the planning, which is top down or bottom up. In the, the, the more standard and general and logical way of doing uh, the planning is a top down, where you break down the plan, you identify into the activities and then you drill it down and then further get into the scheduling mode and identify the uh, project's definition and benefits case. In the bottom-up case, you basically refer to the uh, similar project done in the past and then you start from the bottom and then try and modify as per the new project requirement. For example, if you take a hospital building and if this project was done in, uh, in a particular location and the new project is going to be done within say 10 miles or 20 miles or within the same area you can say, but it just need to have few more additional rooms. So you have the data, you have all the lessons learned, you've got the historicals with you. So you pick up all this information and start from the bottom and then come up with the benefits case at the top. But having said that, it is not restricted, you can always start from the fresh and that is what the general approach is. The top down is the, the default option uh, chosen for the uh, planning uh, any, any project. So what are the components and the elements of the plan? The first and key component of the plan would be the scope of work which lists down your work breakdown structure, identify what you're going to achieve in, in this whole project, whether you're going to finish at the mechanical completion, where you need to pre comb it, whether you need to start up it, or, we, or you just hand over the project to the client up to certain stage. So this scope of work document is one of the key element of the plan. The next one is the method of execution. How are you going to execute this project? Whether you're going to do it LSTK, whether you're going to do it, which is lump sum turnkey, whether you're going to do it reimbursable, whether you're going to do it split, it all depends upon the company's corporate strategy, how they want to implement this project. Uh, in different regions, they have different uh, plans uh, and depend upon the, um, the local, ge local geographics and the local productivity factors, you can uh, understand uh, or figure out how you want to execute the plan. It could be stick built plant, it could be modular, modular based plant, but again, all these things needs to be identified in the beginning stage and uh, completely or final formally put into the place in the plan and that goes into the method of education or project execution plan. The third thing is project budget which is obviously very important. Um, all the strategy which you are putting in, uh, in, the, in the beginning is aimed towards meeting the project budget. There is no point in uh, preparing a plan which, which, uh, is, which is bursting your project. So of course you, that also tells you how you are going to utilize the resources, whether you are going to use multiple offices and whether that's that going to bring you reduce your cost or increase your cost. So the project budget is another key component of the plan followed by your time objectives, which is project milestones. The project milestones is, is a very tricky thing. It could be client milestones, it could be intermediate milestones, it could be permitting milestones, it could be project completion milestones. So these needs to be clearly identified and you need to understand towards which milestones you're actually working to uh, working with. Um, suppose you're working 
uh, sometimes the client client give you a couple of options okay you can you can do the mechanical completion and then you can leave the startup or you can use but we need the complete startup you don't need we don't really worry about the mechanical completion because we need to start one particular phase so you really need to understand those time objectives put this into the plan and uh, take take this further okay so we just slightly going into detail of all these objectives like as we discussed the scope it it basically focus on the project of uh, program objectives it gives you the understanding of specific expectations and requirements of course it list out all the work which needs to be done for example epc project you're going to do the engineering you're going to do procurement you could be doing fabrication offsite fabrication construction and of course commissioning again as i said before the commissioning could not be in the may not be in your scope maybe the client is doing it but again that needs to be identified at the beginning and of course that also gives the framework for managing changes so tomorrow <coughs> this scope on based on the scope document all your litigations all your change management will uh take place in future even if you go to the code the basis the main key document which will be referred to would be the scope document so it, we need to make sure that that's that's in place in a right order project execution plan okay so as as i mentioned we going to uh, this project execution plan we identify what are the services we going to provide what are the work processes we going to be used what are the procedures to be followed what will be the basis for the work plans all these questions get addressed into the project execution plan what are the resources which you are going to use and what will be the division of responsibility for example if you are using multiple offices this office would be doing particular scope of work and one particular office would be doing a particular package so the project execution plan basically is a guidance document telling you how you going to execute this job uh, project this is not a project controls execution plan project controls execution plan is a part of a project execution plan which also includes the automation plan engineering plan your safety plan your operations plan so the project execution plan is 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 is, is the overall master document which helps you uh, navigate uh, or basically give you the direction on how you going to proceed with the project so what do you need to uh, build a plan of course scope definition needs to be very clear if it is not then of uh, course seek seek the questions get get the information from the client and get it clarified execution strategy we we discussed before lump sum reimbursable uh split scope whatever it is then identifying and defining the activities and milestones necessary uh again it would be based on the scope document uh in which the client might have uh, re uh, requested particular milestones to be achieved by a particular date so that would be the information required for build the plan okay you need to be creative this is where the people skill comes into the picture um you need to you need to think out of the box sometimes um, you cannot build the projects with your normal uh, uh, or a standard execution strategy you need to find some more innovative way you need to be flexible in your approach and try and see how we can mitigate this plan or we can even do it in a lesser cost in optimum cost of course without jeopardizing the safety aspect of it like i uh, like, like i said you could be possibly purchasing uh, placing some orders before even starting the project of course if the client permits you on that one uh that would help you in uh, bringing your lead time down which could ex uh, uh, accelerate your um, in your construction but again the next question would be coming is would your engineering would be enough in evolve to allow you to do the orders the that can be done because generally what happens in any pc project there's enough the sufficient detail uh, uh, is being done in the feed stage itself so based on those document you can possibly start the rfq or a specifications process in the beginning to allow the um uh construction to start early you could also put the modularization into the place you can start the modules uh, somewhere off site uh, and and just bring them uh, to the uh, to, to the project uh, construction site and stick build it so you need to create it you need you need to think how how we can how, how we can reduce the plan because this is more the, the, as i said the plan is 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 the, the first document which comes into the place and the schedule is built upon the plan so the majority of the thought process goes into the plan so you need to you need to give all your attention uh while preparing this document of course you need to identify the level of detail the plan need not to be extremely detailed you just need to identify how you going to execute the project what the stages are how the milestones are meeting up are they aligned are they meeting the client objectives and of course integrating with the disciplines how uh, whether whether engineering is um, appropriately integrating with the uh, procurement and procurement is integrating with the construction just a quick example whether your engineering is supporting your procurement effort fabrication effort whether your model reviews are enough uh, uh evolved to support the uh, fabricator to build build that package so the integration needs to be highlighted into this plan in in the beginning stage itself 
So, then mm -hmm. once we move to the, the schedule, the uh, schedule development, the some of the questions asked by the scheduler is what is the scope of work which is generally being identified into the plan. Official contractor award or notice to proceed, yeah, there sometimes client gives you the notice to proceed and does not give you the official contract award. There could be various reasons for it. Uh, most of the times it because of the financial uh, decision making process which sometimes take time, but the client take a cautious note, give you the notice to proceed award NTP that is what it is called it and then ask the contractor to move on and then uh, the official contract award starts. You need to be careful, sometimes the client puts a restriction, you cannot place any purchase orders before the, um, uh, the official contract is placed because of the again the financial commitment uh, which has taken place. So you could be doing just the advanced engineering until you reach to the, that stage. So these, these are certain, certain parameters which need to be understood while we are building the schedule. And okay, what constitutes completion? Again, that is identified into the scope document. Sometimes the uh, completion means the MC, sometimes completion could be means the connecting to the client's uh, existing refinery or sometimes the completion could also mean, um, uh, what do you call it, I um, have just gone blank, I am sorry. Okay. As a, uh, continuing on that scheduler, uh, what the question scheduler asks, the key questions which are asked in what task will you perform which is identified into the scope and how the task will be performed which will be into the execution plan, what is the sequence in which the task will be performed which will be the execution plan. And so it is mostly evolved towards how you are going to build the job and what resources you have in your hand and what is the execution strategy. So these are the three, three key areas which are basically required by the scheduler to put the schedule into the place. and the deliverables associated with the plan as we just seen in the previous slide which is the plan, the scope book, the execution plan, of course the estimate because your project you have awarded is based on the um, estimate you have submitted to the client and of course the budget, you, the question, next question is what is the estimate and the budget, it is actually of course the budget would be uh, not be including your profit margins and the estimate would have uh, all the contingencies into it, so the budget is given by the company to uh, you to imp install that project within the particular amount and the basis, what are the assumptions which you are doing to put, put the plan into. So we will just quickly go through what are the planning terms. So WBS is the first key term which comes to my mind when uh, we discuss the planning which is uh, work breakdown structure. You, you basically identify the scope of work into the particular um, uh, areas, for example, as I said. E, P, F and C which is engin engineering, procurement, fabrication, construction, the under engineering you could have various disciplines and the procurement you could have long lead items, you could have the bulks, under the fabrication you could be having some process unit, it could be some pipings and the construction commissioning. So basically you create the WBS, how you gonna uh, basically build, build this job and what would be your uh, execution strategy. Basic WBS also gives you a guidance on, on your on your execution strategy because it, sometimes it could be not e, just EPC, it could be say uh, office in X location, F office in Y location, office in Z location and office in X location doing the engineering, F office in location Y would be doing the procurement and efficient uh, office in location Z could be doing the construction. So this also aligns to your execution plan and tells you how you are going to execute the job and that also helps you in building the plan for the project. So how, how, how important is the WBS? Of course, it is one of the critical uh, uh, documents of, of, of any project because it ensures that you do not miss any of the key aspects of the project. It also uh, uh, break down the complexity of the project into the manageable parts and it gives you a framework for execution of the project, clearly identifying who is going to do what and what are the, what are the in integrated, what, are the, what is the integration between each level and what each discipline you are going to implement the project for. The network diagram, it is a logical display uh, of your sequence of work, you are going to do a very simple example, you are going to do the foundations, you are going to, well, first of all you do the excavation, you do the foundation, then your equipment comes in, but then again the, for the equipment to come in, you need to place an order for it. So basically it shows the logical sequence of your uh, activities uh, for, for the project and helps you understand what is the flow of the project and how basically you are arriving it to the completion. When you do the network uh, diagram, you also do the CPM analysis which is a critical path uh, method analysis, uh, giving you the criticality of the project, giving you the uh, critical path of the project, understanding you what are the areas of concerns are. So I think 
one of another key document or, uh, or aspect of the uh, the planning and scheduling is, is the network diagram to which to start with. This is how it looks like. Um, the red ones you can say it's a critical path. The blue ones they may not be in the critical. So, why this schedule is important? Actually, schedule is the most important document of the project. I mean, of course, the cost aspects are as well uh, being addressed. But for for implementing any any project, the schedule is the most important document because it identifies the scope of the work. It it tells you um, what are the parameters you are going to work for, what are the resource loading you are going to have, what are the long leads items we uh, on the project, and of course the most important thing what it does is it's a communication tool to the whole team. It tells the mechanical discipline what you are going to do at what point of time. It tells you the construction team what you are going to do at what point of time, and also tells the operation team when this plant would be ready and you can start coming and start your setup. So, it is one of the key guidance document on the project helps you in understand what the project stage is and how the project is moving to. And the same thing we just try to elaborate it in a detailed manner. So, what are the scheduling terms sir? The first thing is activity for install uh, for example, issuing the mechanical specifications or laying the foundation. It, it has a, it has got a definition definable start and definable finish and of course, it consumes time it, it, it needs resources and it is measurable for install uh, for example, if you are laying a foundation you can measure it into the cubic feet. If you are issuing a PNID, you can measure it by its, its various stages whether it is issued for approval, it is issued for um, review or it is issued for construction. So, the activity is basically helps you uh, breaking down the final uh, uh, task of the each, each, each plan. The work packages, work packages as you can say is, is the, is the group of activities combined together. For example, mechanical specifications for a particular rotating equipment all together putting together or you can say um, the work package for the construction area A which includes 10 foundations and 10 equipments. So, basically you are going slightly one level up putting all the uh, activities together and form a work package to uh, uh, to help you in planning for the particular area. Milestones, yes of course, these are the very important critical milestones. These need not to be the end milestone, there could be intermediate milestone. For example, permits, you cannot get the permits unless you are say for 40 percent to the stage of the project or you cannot get the permits until you submit particular key documents. So, the milestones are have no resources, they have no duration, they are fixed and the single point of time and of course, uh, they have a unique definition, they are yes or no. You could be we got to go ahead, yes, then we proceed. If you do not, we do not have the particular sanction, it stops there. So, uh, we can also put the um, end milestones as a constraints and try and understand the critical path of the project by doing the CPM analysis on it. Pretty successor, it's pretty much obvious. What needs uh, for each activity, what we discuss is we will have a predecessor and a successor. For example, again for the link the foundation, you need to the excavation done, and the successor would be actually your putting the equipment on it. And there are different uh, type of logics uh, in each uh, predecessor and successor, which we'll follow on in, in this session here. Yep. There are four key logics, which is finish to start, start to start, finish to finish, and start to finish. Start to finish. Start to finish is generally which is not used. Um, uh, in any of the project, but it is um, it could be sometimes handy uh, in, in certain conditions. But the finish to start is a, is a very standard uh, logic. I finish this and I start this. Start to start, you can do both activities parallelly and finish to finish, you can finish both the activities parallelly irrespective of when they are starting. So, I think it is pretty basic, uh, but of course, if you have any questions, we can always discuss that at the end of the session. The lag, sometimes you put the offset, you could uh, this which is not a very standard practice to put the lag, but sometimes the conditions are you need to uh, set the uh, lag into particular activities. So, look, if it is F S, generally if it I once I, I do, do my uh, excavation done, uh, I can uh, start my foundation, but some you could possibly put a lag into it for inspection and uh, it again depends. If you are breaking down your schedule to level 4, you might not need the lags. You could possibly identify each activity and do the standard logic. But if you are doing the level 2 plans or level 3 plans in, 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 a, in a software, you could put some lags and identify what the reasons for the lags are. The total float is, is, is the product of uh, critical path analysis when you do uh, and uh, try and the forward pass and backward pass cal calculation which we will see in the next slides. And the free float again um, is a product of CPA. The total float uh, can be explained in a way that if you delay your project by a single day, uh, a particular activity you can delay your project by a one day. 
But the free float, is, free float can be defined if you delay your pro, uh, particular activity by one day, it, it does not mean that you are delaying your project by one day because it, it has still have a cushion and it can still push on unless the free float becomes a total float. So the total float basically has the control to delay your project and that is why it needs to be controlled. The critical path which we just discussed. Okay, uh, we just going to quickly go through the uh, common scheduling failures. What happens uh, despite of putting this execution plan into place, with despite of identifying the scope of work, despite of uh, having the execution strategy in place, despite of having all the resources into place, having WPS, having the logic diagram, we got everything. But sometimes still the schedule fails. What are the reasons for it? The, the one of the biggest reason for that is the lack of buy-in. The the responsible parties in the project do not really buy-in uh, for uh, for that schedule and it is sometimes approved without their consent or they are being forced to agree for it because of the client pressure or maybe for, for, for any uh, internal project uh, interest reasons. And one of another reason could be the lack of planning at the beginning stage itself there was not enough paid uh, enough attention paid uh, in building the, uh, in, in the right plan which is resulting into putting your schedule through that that is another one and poorly defined activities yes of course. If you do not, if you miss some of the critical uh, uh, deliverables into your schedule, of course, this would result into the uh, schedule failure. Detail level of detail is very important. If you do not have enough detailing into it, and then you you could again miss out some key areas. Pure poor estimation, lack of information, and lack of sufficient funding. Yeah, that's another reason. Uh, if you do not have enough funding and you build a plan based on assumption that you will be getting funding for this project, again that was that somewhat is linked to the first point which is lack of buying for the project. So maybe the finance team did not buy into the, that one and then you build the, build the project and then of course you schedule fails after that. We just quickly go through the hierarchy of, hierarchy of schedules. There are three, uh, four uh, key level of schedule. One is the milestone level, uh, milestone summary schedule which is the level one, the project intermediate schedule level two and level three and level four which talks about the detail aspect of the schedule. The milestone summary schedule is, is, a, very, is a very broad picture seen from 30,000 feet of the height. And which tells you when you're going to engineering is going to complete, when you're going to procurement is going to complete, and when you're going to construction is going to complete. Identifying key in milestones, key issues, key uh, areas of constraints, concerns, nothing more. It need not to be more than one page. It is not to be rolled up off your level four schedule. It, it's a very straightforward schedule. It could be an Excel format highlighting the key objectives of the project. And then intermediate schedule is, is, is a detailed version of the level one, which is a rolled up of level three and which further details breaks the down from your engineering, procurement and construction to uh, uh, critical areas, your disciplines, your construction areas. Uh, but again, that it stops there and because the level three takes you down to the packages uh, and identify and help you identify how you're going to ex execute the project. For an EPC schedule, we say for engineering, we got to have discipline, for procurement, we have got uh, the um, uh, demand by facility, area system, long leads and the construction, what areas and group by the system. Systems would come place when you are going to put, uh, do the commissioning and the areas basically when you do the construction. Level 4 are the actual working schedules because you are you, you, generally not able to work with the level 3 schedule because it does not have enough sufficient details and you tend to build the level 4 schedule which is more measurable and more controllable. And um, this is the schedule with which you issue to the team on a weekly basis when the project is on. Sometimes when the projects are small, you may not need to go to the level 4 and you could possibly be happy with the level 3 itself. CPM scheduling, it, it, is, it is a calculation of your earliest start dates and the late start dates and early, early finish dates and the late finish date based on the forward pass and the backward pass calculation. So, uh, as we see in the, in, the, in the network logic diagram, you, ha you, you, you build your schedule with uh, predecessor and successor identified into a particular chart and then you put durations into each of the schedule, you put the logics into it and then that you that, that and, and that helps you in calculating uh, what would be the start dates and what would be the finish dates for your project. There are two types of start dates and finish dates, so the late start, late finish and early start, early finish. The late start and late finish, uh, late finish dates are the basically the governors of the, your total float. So if you are missing your late start and late finish date, that means definitely your uh, going to delay your overall project schedule, but early start, early finish dates may not be depend upon how much float you have between the uh, late late dates and the early dates. You can say the total float is between is, is is the mathematical calculation of late dates and the early dates. That's what we just mentioned. So the total float, um, which is which is we discussed that how much we can delay your project 
without uh, how much how much you can delay your activity without delaying the project that gives you the uh, comfort and the negative float that means you are you have already delayed and you might need to reschedule it uh, might need to readjust the duration so there are uh, two key flow uh, two type of floats the total float and free float i think we discussed that who owns the responsibility of the float so that's one of the key questions and debate going on everywhere the the responsibility of the float lies with the contractor until you build the schedule until you get it approved from the client but once the schedule is approved by the client and you shoot for the execution generally the float is shared between all the parties uh, as for the fedic contracts um, th this is the shared responsibility and no one can really owns it. it it is it is not there for the consumption it is only to put into the use if uh, if the things changes or if you have some unforeseen circumstances on the project and the client authorizes you to change it but again it varies sometimes contract conditions um, clearly categorically mention that it can be utilized by the contractor completely no there, there's no con uh, control by the client but it could be otherwise as well so but there is no standard definition but uh, ideally speaking um, once the contract or plan is approved uh, it, it it should be shared by everyone because um, the client knows about it and there's no point in hiding into it so of course displaying a uh, float has got its own advantages and disadvantages so let's discuss the what are the disadvantage that would uh, that might give the end user an idea oh i can delay this activity by 10 days because i've got a float in it that that gives the impression and that is why sometimes people uh, the efficiency goes down it could give you a false sense of security oh we got enough time in our hand it could um, uh, it, 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 it and you need to remember it once it's gone uh, in a particular activity it's used it, it's gone for the whole of the project it's not gone for one particular discipline because the float is not owned by a particular discipline and of course it, it assumes that the cpm logic is complete and accurate which is not in 99 percent of the cases there are always uh, some last minute information there is some more uh, firm information came up in the last uh, minute and that might eat up the float so you should not ever assume that your com cpm uh, logic diagram is complete and then you can consume your float but the disadvantages of not fully displaying uh, total float are also there like maybe the end users would work on the low priority areas they do not work on the high critical item they, no, they are not aware of the critical issues on the project they put too much emphasis on the uh, low priority items and it also <coughs> precludes the line supervisor possibly to efficiently manage the work i think i've managed to finish in the time yeah we got 6 minutes in hand so i thought i'll keep some time for any questions you have i think we've been really fast like super fast express because i started a bit late so i thought let me be very quick and uh, i'd really welcome any opportunity or any questions you may have to discuss through it yeah go ahead yeah I'm sorry. Come again. Float. Uh, the float responsibility. Terminal float. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, client. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, again, uh, as I said to you, there is no clear cut guidance on it. Right. The FEDIC document uh, says has some, some guidance notes on this one. Uh, but the general understanding when the, the, the plan is approved, uh, as we discussed, it should be shared by everyone because client might have some changes into the picture. But you're looking from the contractor side. Uh, if, if there's a, someone who's looking from the client side, oh, we approved this plan. We know there's a float and then we can play with it. And it's a shared responsibility. So, yeah, it's, it's a tricky situation. And that is why you often rec uh, refer back to the contract documents and, the, and, and in every country there are laws uh, in the construction laws where there, uh, uh, there is some guidance provided on this particular aspect. So there is no standard or a specific definition or, or information who owns it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Delay by the client side is actually identified by the intermediate milestone. So, if if there is a delay from client's approval perspective, and if it is shifting your plan, so automatically the client is responsible for it. The float doesn't come into the picture at all there. The float remains there. Uh, it, it, how it remains there by changing the end duration of the project because it de again depends where the the information which is required by the client falls on the critical path in your original plan. If the if that particular information required by the client was not on the critical path and it had some total float in his hand, then it's a different story. Yeah, 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 y